Let us pray. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Alleluia. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. As I said at the start, ascension and transfiguration together again. So you know that you know what that means. Ready, Brother Denny? We're together again. We are together again in one accord. Something good is going to happen. Something good is in store. We are together again. Just praising the Lord. together again in one accord something good is going to happen something good is in store we are together again just praising the So my brothers and sisters, on this the third Sunday of Easter, we have come together to celebrate the resurrection of both Christ Jesus and ourselves, and we have come to celebrate the resurrection season, which is not just 50 days of Easter, but a new beginning of saving and healing that took on another level with the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus. To put it another way, we are here to celebrate that we are New Testament people in contrast to being Old Testament people. In both phrases, Old Testament and New Testament, there is a common word, testament, which means that there is some consistency in the story of God between Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament, as there is between the story of God, between Mark to Revelation in the New Testament. Yet, the existence of the words old and new suggests that there is something different between them. I came across a beautiful quote from Tony Merida, to explain the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It says, Genesis ends with Joseph's death. Deuteronomy ends with Moses' death. Joshua ends with the death of Joshua. The Gospels end with the resurrection of Jesus. And that changes everything. Isn't that a wonderful way of looking at it? Yeah. So on that basis, let us call our reflection this morning, Acts of the Holy Spirit of Christ, chapter 29. Henceforth, it is Acts 29 for short. So the name of the sermon is Acts 29. And let me just say here, the book of Acts is typically called Acts of the Apostles. But if you were to look at the introductory remarks about that book in any translation of the Bible, it makes the point that the book is about the initiative and action of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the apostles of Jesus. Hence, an alternative name is Acts of the Holy Spirit. Now, since Easter Day, 
we have been blessed in the gospel lesson with looking at resurrection appearances of Jesus. And the rationale for this is the fact that to preach Christianity meant primarily to preach the resurrection. According to C.S. Lewis, to preach Christianity meant primarily to preach the resurrection. The resurrection is the central theme in every Christian sermon reported in the book of Acts. So for your assignment, look at all the sermons and see if you don't see some mention to the resurrection. The resurrection and its consequences were the gospel or good news which the Christians brought. Therefore, on Easter Day, we viewed the resurrection from Mark's gospel. Last week, it was viewed from the gospel according to John. And this week, it is viewed from Luke's gospel, which was written according to the author in chapter 1, verse 4, that we may know with certainty the things that have been instructed about Christ Jesus. That we may know with certainty the things that have been instructed about Christ Jesus. It is through the lens of this verse, therefore, that we view this Lucan resurrection appearance of Jesus, which I just read. In it, Jesus appears to his disciples, displaying his hands and his feet, and invites them to handle him. Because, as he says, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as he possesses. And if that is not enough, he goes on to eat a piece of broiled fish. All these actions are in keeping with Luke's intention that we may have certainty about Jesus, especially the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Now, why is this important? Why is it important that we are certain that Jesus Christ lived, and more important, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead? Now, using the book of Luke to explain why this is important, we have to remember, as I alluded, that Luke writes a two-volume book. The first volume is the Gospel of Luke, where he describes the reality of Jesus, God in Christ, appearing on earth with a mission statement, which is described in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, according to the New International Version, as follows. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I would sum up this mission statement of Jesus in this sentence, that Jesus came to save and heal. Jesus came to save and heal. Now, the second volume of Luke's work is the book of Acts, right? Am I right or am I right? Yes, the second volume of Luke's work is the book of Acts. And in that volume, the apostles, as we said earlier, preach about the resurrection of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, they heal and bring people into a saving relationship with Jesus. But if you were to read Acts, it stops at Acts chapter 28. But guess what? Acts doesn't stop at Acts chapter 28. There is a what? A 29th chapter, which has been going on for the past 2,000 plus years. And in Acts chapter 29, the disciples of Jesus Christ 
now go by the title church. And in particular, the church of the transfiguration and the church of the ascension. Who have been blessed with the privilege of turning the world upside down these past 60 odd years. We're a little older than you. So, you know, give, us, give respect to your elders. But together, we have been turning the world upside down where we are located. Despite the efforts of the world to stifle this movement. Now, I chose for my text the kernel of the gospel, John 3, 16 and 17, which we all know. So let us say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Therefore, as people of the resurrection, we have been called to save the world from itself. Let me repeat that. As people of the resurrection, church of the transfiguration, church of the ascension, we have been called to save the world from itself. For example, we have been called to save and heal the world from division and destruction. Look at what's happening both in Jamaica and across the world. The age-old strategy of divide and conquer is still in use with devastating effect. And hence, every Sunday, as a response, Acts chapter 9, we come together to say that that is not, does not have to be so. The resurrection power of Jesus demands something else. And in the name of Christ, we reaffirm the healing power of diversity in unity. Hence, we recommit ourselves to the task by saying, and we know it, so let's say it together. We are the body of Christ. By the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body and have all been made to drink of the one spirit. What are we supposed to do then in response? Let us pursue the things that make for peace and build up the common life. Divide and conquer leads to death. Diversity in unity leads to life. And we believe that through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. So, in the name of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are being sent out into the world to teach the world, wherever you are, to do the same. This is why we are living out Acts chapter, what chapter are we? Acts chapter 29. The resurrection power of Jesus, which says that despite what the world says, that division and, this, and conquering is a way to go. There is an alternative. And that alternative is diversity in unity. Secondly, sisters and brothers, let us appreciate that in living out Acts chapter 29, we have come to save the world from its natural tendency to harbor bitterness and pursue acts of revenge. That is the eye for an eye mentality of the Old Testament. The New Testament sees response to provocation and persecution differently. It teaches us that when Christ was provoked and persecuted, he responded with a higher level. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Michelle Obama would put it this way, when they go low, we go high. In other words, we exercise the ultimate power of love rather than the love of power. I know this is not easy, 
But the resurrection vindicates this course of action because it celebrates the fact that forgiveness has the power to make persons a better version of themselves. Forgiveness has the power to make persons a better version of themselves. My brothers and sisters, I invite you to stop and think how many marriages, how many parent-child relationships, how many relationships between siblings have been healed by the power of forgiveness, which arises out of the reconciliation power of the resurrection. And make no mistake about it. It is when we have better marriages, better families, better friendships, that we have better communities and better nations. The resurrection and reconciliation power of God's offer of new life in Christ Jesus is such that it has to make us contemplate that if God was willing to exercise forgiveness to the extent of dying on a cross, how then can I not forgive my brother, my sister, my spouse, my parents, my children, my friends? Let me repeat that. The resurrection and reconciliation power of God's offer of new life in Christ Jesus is such that it has to make us contemplate that if God was willing to exercise forgiveness to the extent of Christ dying on a cross, how then can I not forgive my brother, my sister, my spouse, my parents, my children, my friends? Indeed, the heart of our worship is that God allows us to have eternal life through our participation in the resurrection and reconciliation power of Jesus. Therefore, in keeping with Acts chapter, both inside and outside of the building, our responsibility is to do likewise with each other and to teach others to do the same. Hence, this is why we say, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, what are you to do? Leave your gift at the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and sister and then come and offer your gift. Sisters and brothers, I will admit that there is some naivety in thinking that teaching people how to solve conflict through the tool of forgiveness can make a difference to the high level of interpersonal conflicts that we have in Jamaica. But what do we have to lose? And interestingly, now we see that government agencies are beginning to see what Christ told us 2,000 years ago through the program called Restorative Justice which I would encourage members of both our congregations to become involved. Finally, although not conclusively, as we live out Acts chapter 29, through the resurrection power of God demonstrated in Christ Jesus, which is calling upon us to save the world, and in this case now, to save the world from that dreaded mistake of persons valuing themselves by their possessions as against by their sense of worth, especially as found in Christ Jesus. Many in this world have placed their identity in material things and find that without the proper perspective of an identity in Christ, their reliance on material things whether they possess them in abundance or not, has been a source of sorrow for them. I share this brief story. Google this name, Boris Becker. That, that dates me. But those of us in my age group will remember that he was a top tennis player many years ago. 
one Wilberdon and all of those. And so he became rich, famous, and powerful. But he testified that he had all the things that money could buy, and yet he had no inner peace. Based on that story, let us understand this, as N.T. Wright, bishop and theologian says. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. This, after all, is what the Lord's Prayer is about. Think about it. The Lord's Prayer says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, the Acts chapter 29 project in which our congregations are involved is to be sent out into the world where God has placed you individually and where God has placed us collectively in our respective buildings and proclaim the following, that the kingdom of God is justice or righteousness, as some translations have it, peace and joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the response to this is, they who thus serve Christ are acceptable to God and approved by others. This, of course, is a difficult but necessary change flowing from the resurrection. Because if the spiritual value of integrity, that is us practicing what we preach, alongside that of justice, which is each person being treated fairly, irrespective of position, is difficult. But I assure you, when this happens, we will mitigate the world destroying us by corruption. And let me just say this about corruption. Corruption is not so much about bribery. That's how we tend to see it. But I want to say that corruption is more about us not treating each other as human beings made in the image and likeness of God. In other words, Corruption is about embracing the animal farm concept, which says all are equal, but some are more equal than others. Sisters and brothers, God in Christ is sending us out in the resurrection power of God in Christ to practice righteousness, which is not being holier than thou, but having right relationships with God and each other. So, as I wrap up, we're living Acts 29, in which, vis-a-vis -vis the mission statement of God in Christ, we are called now to carry out that mission statement, which is to basically heal and save ourselves, the world from itself. And I've listed three areas that we have to save the world from itself. The first is that divide and conquer strategy which leads to death and destruction. The second is that eye for an eye mentality. And the third is to value ourselves by way of our possessions rather than who we are in Christ Jesus. That's Acts chapter 29. And you see this book, we call the red book, you notice I've utilized it to say that it gives us the tools to carry out Acts chapter 29. It gives us the tools to carry out Acts chapter 29, found on page 123 to 124. So, the post-communion prayer is going to send us out into the world to carry out Acts chapter 29. But as I close, I have to make this point that both our congregations may be concerned and understandably so about our numerical, financial, function, functional, and spiritual strength. 
and those concerns are real. But I have to balance them myself by saying that these concerns must be placed in the context of the resurrection, which means that death may take place, but it will be followed by resurrection. And that happens when we share our story with the world. I share this thought with you from Stanley Orowas. Our problem is very simple. We simply do not know how to live as people who believe that Jesus is the resurrected Lord. We simply do not know how to live as people who believe that Jesus is the resurrected Lord. And by that, all the things that we say on page 123 to 124 has currency and value in this world to save the world from itself. And when we practice that, when we practice that, it may not show itself in a full church, but it will show itself where it counts most in saving the lives of people and healing them, restoring them to wholeness and strength. And maybe, just maybe, as a consequence of that, they may want to come into our buildings and worship with us. I close with a collect for today, which emphasizes that point. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, diversity in unity, the power of forgiveness, valuing ourselves not by what we possess but by who we are in Christ. Yes, Open our eyes of faith that we may see him, Jesus, in all his redeeming work as we practice Acts 29, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>